Firstly, we want to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands that we meet here tonight and pay our respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal people, both past and present. 2014 has seen the punishment of those who seek safety and asylum in Australia taken to new levels of horror. At the end of May, there were over 4,000 people locked up in Australian detention centres, of which 1,200 were held in Christmas Island. 1,770 in Nauru and a further 1,225 held in detention in Manus Island. In February, we saw the death of Reza Bharati, a direct consequence of the, gov of the government's policy on refugees. Of over 6,400 people in detention, 893, sorry, 983 are children. And despite the numerous reports documenting the damage and harm that is done by mandatory detention, with people stripped of their dignity and any certainty of their future, this government has the audacity to continue to claim that their policies are driven by humanitarian motives. The evidence to the contrary is stark and terrifying. With the new senators taking their seats on July 7, this meeting is being held to send a message to Parliament that we stand by the refugees and asylum seekers and we stand for their rights. I want to tell you a story about a young father, Atash. He is from Iran and I met him when I visited Nauru in December last year. In the Nauru Detention Centre, there are virtually two big compounds. It's in the middle of the phosphate mine, in the middle of the island. And there is the family compound and there is the, the uh, what they call the single men's compound, but then most of them aren't single men's. Mo most of them are uh, uh, fathers, brothers, uncles, sons. They're, they're not doing this on their own. In fact, they're doing it often for the freedom of their families. I was in the um, family camp on this particular day and I was, I'd spent the morning with um, the children who were there and there was about 130 children and I spoke to them and um, talked to them about how they were feeling and, and where they came from and I took uh, paper and pencils and we drew together. It's one of the best ways to work out what kids are really thinking is to sit down with some paper and some pencils and you should see the horrifying pictures I'm sure many of you have that have come out of my visit uh, in Nauru. And in the afternoon I was talking to the parents and I specifically wanted to talk to them separately to the children because I really wanted to hear what was on their mind and what they wanted to tell me. And this young father stood up and he said, you know, I'm a journalist. I was a journalist in Iran and I covered the elections and I wrote the truth about what was happening in my community. And that's why um, from that moment onwards he became a target. He said, but it's not about me. It's about the fact that every day that I'm in this camp, I have a four-year-old and a seven-year-old, and every day they say, Dad, why am I here? Why are we here? When are we getting out? And he said to me, it's, about a, it's been about 150 days so far and I don't, I, I, I give up. I can't keep lying to them. And this is a guy who's seen some pretty horrific things in his lifetime already. He risked his entire family's life because he thought it was worth it to get out of Iran, to get on a boat and come to Australia. And it was in Nauru trying to explain to his seven-year-old why it was that they had to line up for four hours a day just to get lunch in the beaming sun and then again in the afternoon just to get dinner and make sure there was something left. Why there was no toys, why there was no play equipment, why they lived in a tent with seven other families with no privacy, why they had to line up to go to the bathroom and why there was a security guard outside the bathroom who every three minutes knocks on the door and says, your time's up. Now this father said to me, I can't, I, I give up. I can't keep lying to my 
kids. I can't make up any more stories about how we're going to get out of here or, or why we're here. <coughs> so I've just stopped talking. I got an email from that young father a couple of months ago, sorry, a couple of weeks ago, and um, he's just as desperate as he was then, and he's still there, and his kids are still there, and they will be there for a very, very long time under this government's policy. What I think is alarming, most alarming to most of us about current policy is the extent to which deterrence has become a central element of what is being attempted. And there, anybody who's read a little bit about the deterrence theory would realise that it is intrinsic in the notion of deterrence that you give people a bad time or you threaten them to them. There is nothing in a deterrent approach which leaves space for treating people humanely or decently or providing them with the kind of care that somewhat naively the expert panel on asylum issues uh, reporting to Julia Gillard suggested might be supplied in places like Nauru or Man Asylum. It's not remotely surprising that these places have turned into hell holes. That is actually the point of the exercise. Because the entire focus of mandatory detention, offshore detention, deterrence versus support and help is to alienate and dehumanise refugees simply because of how they got here. And one of the best things to break down that stigma is to be able to put a face and a name and a story to the people that we're talking about. They risk their lives, knowing they're risking their lives, but that's not enough to deter them. So we have to make coming to Australia look even worse than risking your life at sea. We have to make Australia look uglier than the Taliban or the Rajapaksa regime. I wonder how many Australians there are who would relish the idea that Australia looks nastier than the Taliban or the Rajapaksa regime or the insane theocrats in Iran or any other group persecuting its citizens you want to mention. But that's what our present leaders are trying to do and it seems that they're revelling in the idea that they've been successful. Scott Morrison also, for a lot of last year, repeatedly said that if any uh, quote-unquote illegals uh, were to be settled in the community, they should be required to report regularly to the police and they shouldn't be placed in the community near children or vulnerable people. <laughs> the purpose of that is to convey the dishonest impression that these are dangerous criminals. And then, of course, he renamed the department from Immigration and Citizenship to Immigration and Border Protection. Protection implies a threat. Scott Morrison is deceiving the nation by persuading them that he is protecting the country against dangerous criminals, and it is a lie. Another argument which is put forward, which is in a way even more insidious, is the claim that uh, people who arrive without prior authorisation are somehow jumping a queue. But of course, what we know of the international refugee protection system is that it offers not a place in a queue, but a ticket in a lottery. A queue, as anybody who's been to the shops will realise, is an allocation mechanism whereby if you get to the head of the queue and goods are still available, the shopkeeper will sell them to you. Whereas what we know about refugee resettlement mechanisms is that people can be excluded because, for example, they have disabilities that could make it expensive to provide them with treatment in a host country. Or they lack a sponsor in the country to which they're seeking to go, even though there's no correlation between need and the availability of a person to provide sponsorship. By tagging these uh, boat people who've come here as dangerous criminals, it deprives us of the desire to empathise with their circumstances. And I believe it's been done deliberately and knowingly for political advantage. In the places where they had fled, and then for the most part brought many of them to Australia safely. We are a better place as a result. We <laughs> We can make these changes. Difficult as they seem now, we can make these changes. This movement has fought for years and forced changes in the past. Other movements apparently unpopular in their day, against the Vietnam War, against white Australia for women's equality, eventually prevailed. We will as well. 
Uh, of all the dimensions of argument that surface in that context, the one that I find personally most nauseating is the argument that uh, deterrent measures which are blatantly cruel to ordinary people are justifiable because they are saving lives at sea. This is actually preposterous. What happens under these circumstances? <laughs> what happens if you establish an effective deterrent regime in one part of the world is that you simply squeeze the vulnerable into other parts of the world which may be even more dangerous as routes of egress. The, the, the drowning idea is utterly untrue. I don't think for a minute that Morrison or Abbott is the least bit worried about people drowning at sea. If they were worried about it, they wouldn't have tried to reintroduce temporary protection visas, because temporary protection visas have two particularly uh, repellent conditions. One is you're only protected for three years, and after that, you've got to demonstrate again that you're a refugee. So here you are in a country with a different language and a different culture, and you're just treading water for three years because you don't know if this is going to be your home or whether you're going to be sent back after three years. Any parliamentarian who's willing to say they want to reintroduce temporary protection visas and tells you they're worried about people drowning is lying. Uh, nominally, uh, a system of states charges each state with the duty of protecting its citizens, but we all know very well that in the modern world there are states that either fail it to discharge that duty or actively persecute their own citizens. And those uh, individuals and countries that benefit from this system then owe a duty towards those whom the system has failed. But finally, there's a, a basically humanitarian obligation towards uh, refugees as well, that we would expect that if we were in their situation, we would be treated humanely. Uh, and we cannot deny people that kind of protection and then expect that we would be treated any more humanely by other people if we were to find ourselves in dire circumstances. And that's something of which I think some of our politicians need to be persistently reminded. It is time the government learns what its people stand for. Where we stand will define us, our country and our values for a generation and more. This is what we stand for. We stand for the humane and dignified treatment of asylum seekers and refugees in accordance with our international obligations. We stand for allowing people who arrive by boat seeking asylum in Australia to live and work in the community while their claims are being processed, rather than being forcibly detained in Australia or sent overseas to Papua New Guinea, Nauru or other countries. We stand for a system which provides permanent protection and does not discriminate against refugees on the basis of their documentation or means of arrival. We stand, we stand for saving lives at sea by providing fair and speedy assessment of asylum claims in Indonesia and Malaysia and the guaranteed timely resettlement in Australia of those, those found to be refugees. The other two very familiar, often repeated lies are that they're illegal, and Scott Morrison has raised that to an art form. Um, he, he relentlessly calls uh, boat people illegals when they don't break any law at all. He has made it official policy inside the department that the people previously called irregular maritime arrivals must in future be called illegal maritime arrivals. And I've seen the directive to the staff, it's quite chilling because he's actually telling public servants to lie to each other and to the public. I think it's also important to recognise that there are large numbers of people in the wider community who don't share our views, not because they are necessarily vicious or evil, but because they have been systematically misled by a generation of political leaders, misled into believing that people are acting illegally if they seek to approach Australia for protection by boat without prior authorisation. If we spent even a fraction of the $8.3 billion over the forward estimates, assessing people's claims and helping them in terms of their welfare needs in places like Malaysia and Indonesia on the Pakistan border, we would save money and save lives. And that's what we should be doing. Australia now 
has refugee policies which are crueler than those of any other Western nation. And the policies are supported electorally on the basis of a series of lies. It is only because of the lies that the, parliament, that the politicians get away with it. And let me make it very clear. I don't think our politicians accurately reflect Australian values. I think most Australians are decent people. If most Australians understood what is going on instead of being misled by politicians' lies and those lies magnified by the news limited media, I don't think that most Australians would go along with it. Yes, the question is, if a boat arrives and the minister doesn't speak about it, does that mean it doesn't exist? <laughs> um, no, Mr Morrison, it does. And people are starting to be wise to his tricks, to his nastiness, to the government's obsession with cruelty and secrecy. But we have to continue to stand up. We're faced with a government which is treating with deliberate cruelty a group of people who've done nothing worse than ask for our protection. And 90% of them over the last 15 years have ultimately demonstrated on our test that they are legally entitled to refugee protection. Um, and yet we keep mistreating them. We have Abbott and Morrison particularly parading themselves as devout Christians but lying to us repeatedly in order to get the political advantage that they seek uh, from their policy against boat people. We should not let them trash our national reputation. We like to think of ourselves as generous, warm, welcoming, laid back, fair go for everyone. That's not the way the world sees us these days. We stand for a much more generous approach to accepting refugees in accordance with the wealth of our country. And we stand for a country which welcomes refugees for their positive contribution to Australia's economy, culture and society. Do not let them forget. It is the Australian community that is the consciousness of our government and you have to speak up. Stop the cruelty, stop the barbarity and stop the politicians.